uh, welcome to the um, TED talk. Thank you for having me here. Um, so um, basically, um, be talking about how to create a better world using exponential technology and thinking. Um, so I was uh, an investment banker in Wall Street in the late 80s when greed was good. Um, good for the banks, but maybe not so good for the people. Hence, I do what I do now, which is a lot of social enterprise stuff. Um, and then I became an academy. I was the associate dean at Bond University in Australia. Um, and then I became an entrepreneur. I set up a company uh, called Bond Wireless, where we basically did um, text messaging with security um, technology and so on with patents in China and the um, rest of the world. Um, and then I became an investor. So I invested in this company, The Forest. So if you guys play computer games on Steam, uh, you probably heard of this game. It's been around for uh, five years now, and in a top, uh, in a bit in the top ten game that's been sold. And they just released it on the PS4. Uh, one of my better investments. And uh, <laughs> this is a company that I'm also an investor in called Focus at Will. And I showed this because I thought you guys are in the school, so you might want to actually use this software. You listen to the music for up to 45 minutes, your productivity might go up by up to 400% in 7 out of 10 people. If you have, um, if you have ADHD or autism, uh, it may not work on you. Uh, you can try it out anyway. Uh, it's pretty cool. And this is the guy that uh, developed it. His name is uh, Will Henshaw, and he was the lead guitarist in Eurimix. So when we talk about technology disruption and so on, this, soft, this piece of uh, music software would actually enhance your productivity. So which company do you think will be disrupted by um, this technology? Well, think about Red Bull, right? You don't need to drink coffee or caffeine to get um, you know, stimulant. You can actually just listen to music. Um, and when we talk about exponential, what do we mean? So when, you, when, when I say you take one step forward and you take 30 steps uh, linearly, you, how far would you have been from your original point? 30 meters, right? But if I say you to increase your steps exponentially, double it every time, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, in 30 steps, how far do you think you have gone? You have gone 26 and a half times around the earth of over a billion meters. And that's what, um, you know, the, um, um, you know, what exponential curves mean. And technology such as 3D printing, um, you know, uh, gene sequencing are moving at that pace. And that's why our brain is not able to comprehend that. And I'm going to talk more about it. So as you can see, the exponential curve is essentially uh, starts a very small number. Let's say 0.1, you double it, what do you get? 0.2, you double that, 0.4, under 1, right? So people get um, disillusioned, and they said, well, you know, like 3D printing, right? Oh, it's not a new technology, it's been around for a while. But people get disappointed and say, oh, it doesn't work, you know? But once you hit one, as we see, in 30 steps, you'll be over a billion. And that's the kind of technology that uh, at Singularity we looked at. You know, what kind of technology in 10 years' time would be so cheap or so abundant, right? For example, like LED lights, right? LED lights. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, you would never imagine that the price would be as low as it is now that it's actually putting out uh, incandescent lamp companies. So what's happening in the world right now? This is January 2019, right? We have about 7.7 .7 billion people, and this is the largest um, mobilization of people moving to urban areas, 56%, right? So things are changing. And um, how many people are on the internet today? About 4.5 billion, and by the end of this, uh, a uh, year, it'd probably be five billion. So there's no better time than now to actually be an entrepreneur, right? You have five billion people connected. There could be your potential partners, um, you know, your funders, your customers, um, or even your employees, right? And basically, this is a snapshot of what's happening in the world right now. And the other way of looking at how fast things are moving. So you guys know Harley Davidson, the motorcycle company, right? Took them 86 years to reach a billion dollars, right? Google took eight years. And uh, see, the Chinese companies, they're like wrong 360, took only seven months. But the fastest company that uh, basically went from zero to $1 billion in four months was Jet.com, which is similar to Amazon. The other way of looking at it is how, how long does it reach 50 million people, right? Telephone took like um, 75 years. A radio took 38. Um, you know, Pokemon Go took 19 days, right? And um, Chewbacca Mom took uh, basically 24 hours. So uh, that shows you how fast things are, you know, you can reach that many people at such a fast pace of time. Um, you guys know about Moore's Law, like how technology doubles every 
um, you know, every 18 months. You know, like the speed of computer uh, increases, the price of it drops. But I'm not sure whether you know the sequencing of the genes has fallen faster than Moore's law, right? And wh why is this important? Um, because a lot of medical issues that we know nowadays, uh, that we face nowadays, we don't actually understand it well enough. But if we sequence our genes, right, it can give you a lot of information about it. So it has fallen very rapidly, and uh, China is actually the leading country in sequencing gene, right, BGI, uh, the Beijing Genomic Institute. And essentially, uh, by the end of next year, probably, it'll be cheaper to um, sequence your genes and to flush the toilet. Um, so, you know, you've got like, companies like Origin, uh, 23andMe, and BGI doing gene sequencing. And why is that important? Because it's creating, you know, so like 23andMe, I had my gene sequence back in 2011 when I was at NASA at Singularity. And with that information, you could see what kind of potential disease that you might get, uh, who your ancestors are. It was very interesting because uh, I'm, I'm from Malaysia originally, and my grandparents from my father's side was from Hainan Island. My mom's side was from Fuzhou, right? When I map it, you can see that, you know, the Hainanese side wasn't, it was, you know, it was very, very expected. It's like mainly from Siberia down to New Zealand and mainly in China and Asia, right? But my mom's side, the family of Fuzhou, I'm highly correlated to the American Indians, to the Mayans and the Aztecs. So, you know, I said that, you know, I should go back to America, claim some Indian reservation land and being Chinese, open a, <laughs> open a casino, right? Um, anyway, um, so, so what this has led to is you led to the whole field of pharmacogenomics, uh, pharmacomicrobiomics and epigenetics. What, what are this? So essentially, at the moment, the medication you and I take are prescribed, tested on a small population in the Western world. And these people uh, may not have the same genetic makeup as me, but I'm being given the same dosage and the same drug. So in future, your genes will be sequenced. You could send information up to the cloud, and basically the AI might send the instruction to 3D print your medicine or your nutraceuticals that you need. So that's the whole area of pharmacogenomics. Pharmacomicrobiomics is basically your gut, right? There are more bacteria in your body than there are cells. And uh, epigenetic is how the environment impacts your genes. Um, the problem that we, f we face, right? So I need to tell you, like, you know, um, with all this technology, what good are we doing with it, right? What are the problems we are facing in the world today? We actually don't have a healthcare system, if you think about it, right? The whole ecosystem of healthcare is a sick care system, right? Nobody makes money if you're healthy. But if you're sick, everybody makes money. And that's a very bad model, right? Nobody's interested in, in the health industry to see you healthy. So we look at the old Chinese village doctor model as a solution, right? In ancient China, the village doctor gets paid by everybody in the village every morning if you're not sick. If you're sick, you don't pay, right? You, please don't die on me. If you die on me, I don't get paid, right? So, you know, that's, that, that's how the system should be, right? And, and unfortunately, we do not have that. And uh, that's something that we need to work on, the model itself. Um, and I was at the Exponential Medicine Conference in San Diego. I highly encourage you guys to go. It's uh, run by Singularity University. And basically, this um, lady, uh, Mei Mei Hu from United Neuroscience, essentially is very passionate about finding a way to vaccinate Alzheimer's. As you know, uh, when you turn 85, one in two person will have Alzheimer's, and there's no cure, right? It's like polio in the 50s. So she's working on a cure, and her mom, was the inventor of a vaccine to shrink the testicles of pigs, right? Um, because human males can smell the male, uh, uh, the male pig, the, uh, the, the pork from a male pig. So essentially, her mother discovered a way to vaccinate them, so they would actually shrink it, and essentially less cruel. She's using the same technology to essentially um, shrink the pluck on Alzheimer's. And this is a phase two clinical trials. So it's very promising that she, we might actually get a vaccine. So that's amazing work that she's doing. But what's really cool about her is that she's working on it to try to basically um, make medic, uh, you know, medical care accessible to everybody, democratizing it, uh, and not just trying to make tons of money out of it. So I wrote a book on artificial neural network 20 years ago in finance. So I'm going to talk a bit about AI. And I want to basically um, you know, this is not, not a company from Singularity called Moody's. It's a very useful app, you know, using AI. It basically listens to the way you talk or the way I speak and it, the nuances of the voice and it can tell you how I'm feeling. Am I in love or am I being funny or am I lying, right? I use it all the time when I go to a talk like this and, you know, if the speaker is just BSing me, right, I'll just walk off the stage. Oh, sorry, walk, walk out of the room. Uh, unfortunately, this app is no longer available from the uh, App Store. 
um, but this is an Israeli company called Beyond Verbal. Um, the app was free. They sell the enterprise version at call centers. So when you call and complain about a particular product, and they know that there's no way of pleasing you, they just hang up on you. So it's a very useful app. And you guys know about uh, the valuation of Uber. It's, it's actually now $120 billion is going to IPO soon. And the reason why is because, you know, at the moment, who does Uber pay or DD Chirp pays? They pay the driver, right? So they say they're creating jobs. But in reality, they're working on autonomous vehicle because once it's autonomous, you don't have to pay the driver anymore. That's why they're worth so much. But there's some things that I want you to think about, right, in AI. For example, if you have an autonomous car driving down a single lane bridge and a school bus is out of control coming down this bridge with 20 kids, the program does not understand the life of kids. You know, you as a human can decide to drive the bridge and kill yourself and save the kids. But the program is going to protect you and crash into the bus and kill the kids and you will survive the airbags. So the problem is then, you know, if I ask how many of you would go to a car showroom and buy a car that's ethically correct or kill yourself to save other people, a lot of you will put your hands up. But if you go to the showroom and the salesman tells you like, this car may kill you, but it's always ethically right and this car will never kill you. Would you buy a car that may kill you? Maybe not, right? And you can try that on the MIT Moral Machine. Um, the interesting thing about that is that what happened is um, they, they found that in the different culture, in the Western world, they said, oh, would you kill an older guy, an, an elderly man, uh, to save your own life? Uh, most of the Asians, Koreans, the Chinese and all that would say, no, they'll kill themselves and you know, they respect the elders, right? In the Western world, it's like, yeah, he lives too long, you know, just kill him. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, that was interesting, culturally it was different. Now, the thing is that you guys heard about how AI is taking your job and so on. There's two ways to look at it, right? One is that you're now free to do whatever you like to do. The other is you need to look for a new job. So the best way is actually for AI to work with humans. So what kind of jobs would AI replace? Anything that has reading, writing, speaking, listening, AI can really do all this, right? Your Alexa, your, your Siri, looking at things, integrating knowledge, right? So preparing food, um, diagnosing disease and all that, those kind of jobs will be threatened. So this is from Kai Fu Lee at TED 2018. You can watch his talk. And he talks about like how you know, anything that requires optimization, all these kind of tasks are all going to be replaced. Tasks on this side, on my left, is uh, obviously um, safer because it, it needs creativity or strategy. Right? So AI will replace all these jobs within less than five years, optimization in 15. But complex jobs right, is still pretty safe. Um, the other thing is that jobs that require compassion Right? It's obviously um, you know, safe, but jobs that has required no compassion and totally automated uh, on, on, on the uh, lower quadrant here would be replaced very quickly. So I thought this would be an interesting one for you guys to look at when you're deciding on your career. The best thing to do is be an entrepreneur, create the jobs, right? Um, and essentially, again, you, know, you have AI working with humans, you know, AI playing a small role, AI replacing everybody here, and here AI working with humans. And these jobs here obviously require creativity and compassion will be pretty safe. And um, the next thing I want to talk about is the Japanese term of ikigai. I'm, I, I couldn't find the actual Chinese term. Right? And essentially, ikigai means a sense of purpose, right? Basically, what you love to do, um, what the world needs, what skill sets you have. There's no point saying I want to go to the moon, but you have no idea how to get there, right? And what you can be paid for either in crypto or in cash, all right? Um, and so I'll go through each of them. Essentially, what you love, how do you know what you love to do? The two ways, right, that, uh, well, like three actually, but essentially one is to imagine when you were a kid, and most of you are still <laughs> in the school, I guess, uh, still growing up, right? So, so it's easy for you to find out what you like to do. Um, and if you can't figure that out, imagine today that you cannot fail, and essentially uh, you're already a billionaire. What do you want to do to change the world today? That's what you should be doing, right? Um, second thing is what the world needs. So I highly encourage all of you who are looking at projects to see whether your project meets one or more of the 17 sustainable development goals that all the 193 nations in the United Nations have signed up to to try to achieve by 2030, okay? And you know the current system is broken, right? You have empty homes and you have homeless people in the US, right? You have dumping food, and I was, in, uh, I was in Kenya last year in the largest slum in Africa, Kabara. It was really sad, we feed these kids once a week, and one, every Saturday, it's called lunch bowl, a program, but we couldn't feed everybody. And people are dumping food to just 
try to keep the prices stable. So obviously the system is broken. Um, acquiring skills. How do you acquire skills? Many ways, like here, attending YCIS or basically going to conventional universities. I'm a professor at both these universities. And, um, or you can go to online ones, right? Udacity and Udemy. Um, or you can basically go try and work on a startup weekend project, right? And try your hands, or a combination of those. Um, the university education is not the only pathway to success now, right? As you guys know, I mean, Steve Jobs, um, Bill Gates, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg never graduated, right? So essentially, um, you know, you, there are many paths to actually achieve the success that um, you're looking for in terms of what you want to do. And this is my son. I thought I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you uh, Wilbert, who actually decided to do a gap year in China, right? He actually went, you know, but before he went there, he took part in a startup weekend and worked on this project that won. I mean, it helped that I was a judge, but, you know, I tried to be unbiased. Um, <laughs> so he won. And then uh, he went to... Uh, he went to Fudan University, so I can't see very clearly to do Chinese. He wanted to go to Beita, a Beijing University, but they don't accept people under 18. So when he turned 18, he went to Beita and took a course on data mining, a postgraduate course. And I said, you are a high school graduate, how can you do a postgraduate course? <laughs> he surprised me, he managed to get high distinction, and he went with me to Mongolia, and we did some, uh, you know, in the middle of Gobi Desert, watering stuff. And then he, uh, and, you know, I got him an internship, or he got himself an internship with a, with a project that um, my, a friend of mine was working on, a Hyperloop project with um, Elon Musk. He met Elon Musk, came back to Australia and said, Dad, none of the university here can teach me anything I can't learn from the internet, which is true, right? So took him to Stanford, Berkeley, Singularity, and USC, where the mom and I went to university. And he got into Berkeley, but he didn't want to go. He loved Asia so much. So he's in Singapore University now. And last year, he won the space competition 3D uh, printing of... Um, of uh, microsatellites in, in Airbus in France. Um, so why, why am I showing you this? I'm just showing you the many pathways to do it, and my son is trying everything else, and I would have loved for him to go to Berkeley, but he basically said he doesn't need to. Um, anyway, and then this is Salim Ismail, who wrote a book called Exponential Organizations, of which I'm a part of, and basically we help to transform organization, institutions, and people to grow exponentially. Um, and this is a book that I collaborated on uh, called Exponential Transformation that essentially tells you how to do it. Uh, and it has these uh, 10 attributes in here, and the main thing is your massive transformative purpose. And I will basically uh, just quickly tell you what it is. It is basically, um, you know, like your mantra and guiding you what you need to do with your life. So essentially, if, you know, you could, Google's organizing the world information, TED is ideas worth spreading. And my personal is seek, share, and apply knowledge to progress humanity. So with that, I essentially um, ask you, like, what is your MTP? And uh, essentially um, hope that you guys uh, will achieve exponential success in whatever you do. All right, thank you.